وكما ينبغي لجلال وجهه وعظيم سلطانه والصلاه والسلام على اسعد الخلق وخاتم الرسل محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه التابعين ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين. Quickly I would like to really thank Triple IP for bringing me together on the same panel with my dear brother Dr. Tarek. We worked together on the Center of Islamic Ethics in Doha a few years back. It was a wonderful experience. And thank you Triple IP for bringing us back. And Ambassador Ibrahim Masood is also a dear brother and friend. We'll speak later inshallah on Maqasid al-Shari'ah. My brother Dr. Tarek talked about Maqasid al-Shari'ah and to build on what he said, I would like to talk about Maqasid al-Fiqh. Because there is a difference, my brothers and sisters, between Maqasid al-Shari'ah and Maqasid al-Fiqh. When we talk about Fiqh al-Aqaliyyat, or Fiqh al-Muaqama, we have to ask why. What is the maqsid? What is the purpose? And the maqsid of Fiqh al-Muaqama, or Fiqh al-Aqaliyyat, the Fiqh of citizenship, or the Fiqh, of minority is not exactly equal the maqsid of the sharia. The maqsid of the sharia is justice and mercy and wisdom and the preservation of life and intellect and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the sharia for. But the maqsid of fiqh has to do with the society. So when our scholars, Alwani, Faisal, Mawlawi, when they proposed fiqh al-aqaliyat, their maqsid at that time and their objective was to answer questions of the minorities who are um, communities in the West. And these questions uh, are relevant in their understanding to the West and might not be exactly relevant to the East. And I have a very similar critique, even though I am a member of the European Council for Fatwa and Research, I have a similar critique to my brother Dr. Tarek's critique, that there is no such thing as fiqh al-aqaliyat. Uh, to me, fiqh is fiqh. And a question about what is halal and what is haram is the same question everywhere. Whether you live in America, or you live in Europe, or you live in Egypt, or China, or India. It is the same question, because the Sharia is for everybody. And Muslims being a minority or a majority is irrelevant in the Sharia. Is irrelevant even in the definition of Dar al-Islam. When you go back to the literature, you will see that the Fuqaha said that Dar al-Islam or the land of Islam could be established with one person. But if the Sha'ir al-Islam, if the rituals of Islam are dominated, so Fiqh al-Aqaliyat had a particular objective of answering these questions. But fiqh is fiqh. Fiqh al-Muatana is different. Fiqh al-Muatana developed uh, in the Arab world back in the 70s and 80s to discuss the rights of the minorities. So, Copts in Egypt, Jews in Morocco, etc. What are the rights of the minorities? Are they supposed to pay jizya or tax because they are non-Muslims or not? And so forth. But Fiqh al-Muatana, when it's discussed today, really, like the recent uh, conference that we heard about and, and other conferences, we really need to ask why. Why are we discussing the rights of the minorities in the Muslim-majority countries where the rights of the majorities are not preserved? Instead of speaking about the rights of the Copts in Egypt, let's speak about the rights of the Egyptians. Uh, about, about Muslims and Copts and Jews and everybody in Egypt. Instead of speaking about the rights of the Jews in Morocco, let's speak about Morocco. And why, why uh, the Arab world in general and the Muslim world uh, in general lives under tyrannies, under systems of dictatorships. And these systems use fiqh al these days in order to uh, pacify people, in order to make people loyal to a state rather than to principles, as our dear brother Tariq said. You're supposed to be loyal to principles uh, and not to a system of governance that is supposed to be taking care of your affairs and not you're loyal in a blind way to a system of governance. And in the name of the Muatana, in the name of being 
an Egyptian citizen or a Qatari citizen or a Malaysian citizen, you're supposed to abide by a system of dictatorship that is actually not going by the principles that you're supposed to be loyal to. And therefore, we have to be very careful when we talk about Suq al-Muatana under tyrannies. And we have to really, uh, in the Muslim majority countries, uh, think about Fiqh al tahir rather than Fiqh al-Muatana. What is the jurisprudence or the fahm, the understanding, the deep understanding of change? How can we make change from tyrannical systems into more uh, participatory systems, into systems of justice rather than systems where if you ally with the tribe, you're a citizen, and if you don't ally with the tribe, you're not even a citizen, you're bidun. You don't have a citizenship, or you give up your citizenship in order to let you go, as we see. So whether we talk about republics or monarchs in the Muslim-majority countries, we're talking about countries that are very quickly turning into very strict tyrannical systems that use citizenship as a political and security tool uh, in order to deal with the people. And therefore, fiqh al tahir the fiqh of change, and fiqh al thawra the fiqh of revolution, is supposed to be the kind of fiqh that we should busy ourselves with in the Muslim-majority countries. In Muslim-minority countries, as rightly said, we are citizens. We are not a minority, really. Because once you establish your citizenship, you're part of the system. And you're not supposed to be singled out as a minority. Why do we single out a certain community based on religious uh, lines in a secular state? In a secular state, you're not supposed to identify uh, based on your religion, <coughs> identify based on your citizenship. And once you establish your citizenship, you have all the rights. But Islamophobes with funny agendas like to put Muslims in this bracket. Uh, I'm a Canadian citizen. We don't have this talk about Muslims in Canada because we have a reasonable government. By the way, I mean, you can immigrate to Canada if you wish. <laughs> go online. Uh, the government is expecting a lot of Americans, especially Muslims. But I'm trying to build a wall now between Canada and Canada. <laughs> anyway. So, as, as, as a Canadian, we don't have this debate about Muslims in Canada. We have a number of Canadians here. Because we have a government that is not trying to stigmatize us. But once the government uh, tries to stigmatize you, again, the why of the fifth, why are we talking about the fifth of citizenship in America or in other places? It's because there is a government that is trying to label Muslims in that color in order to deal with them basically in a security way, in a certain bracket. And that is why you find a lot of interest and a lot of promotion for this idea for the sake of the political agendas that are trying to deal with the minority. And 